should I ask before or should I ask now? Hi, Maxim. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Maxim? Yes, yes. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? So could you share your, your slides? Uh, yes. So just the check. So that's uh, okay. Can you see them in full screen? Yeah, perfect. Okay. And it switches, everything's fine. Right. Okay. Yeah. So we continue with the afternoon session with the last two speakers. So the first one is Maxine Emily, who's going to tell us about the weak gravity versus uh, charged massless gravity in the city. So Maxine, whenever you want. Uh, great. Thank you to the organizers for uh, this event and for the opportunity to speak. Um, so I'll be talking about some work that uh, we put out in this paper uh, about a month ago with uh, Gianguida Delagata, uh, Fuiz Farakos, and Matteo Morito. And as the title suggests, uh, I'll be talking about the relationship between the weak gravity conjecture, uh, de Sitter space, and the presence of charged uh, massless gravitini. And to set some context for this work, um, there's been a kind of recent interest in a uh, recent observation, I guess, that uh, the presence of massless gravitini in supergravity appears to correlate with breakdowns of effective field theory descriptions. And uh, there are several uh, papers tackling this from various angles. So in particular, uh, last year, uh, Gian Guido and Foetus, along with uh, Nicolo Cribiori, um, devised a way to uh, exclude various de Sitter uh, critical points on the basis of the weak gravity conjecture in a way that I will review in a bit. Uh, and then they studied uh, many models with uh, in n equals two supergravity. Oh, sorry, in n equals two supergravity with vector multiplets, uh, and found that indeed uh, there was a correlation between the presence of massless gravitini and violations of the weak gravity conjecture. Uh, then there were also some work uh, earlier this year, um, really trying to relate uh, the massless limit of gravitini uh, with things like light towers of states and distance conjectures. Um, and working that, and along those lines. Uh, and, and there was even some, yes, is there? Yeah, and there was even uh, some interest sort of on cosmological grounds, which is largely orthogonal to, to the concerns sort of in, in this line uh, of reasoning. And so the work that I'll be talking about basically picks up uh, where this paper left off, uh, namely studying n equals two supergravity but this time also in models with uh, vectors and hypermultiplets. And we managed to arrive at a uh, sharp result that really excludes any uh, de Sitter uh, critical points with charged massless gravity. So this is really the main result uh, put in, in this gray box. Uh, so in n equals two supergravity, all the sort of critical points where the gravitini have a U1 charge and vanishing mass matrix, so both gravitini need to be massless. Uh, they essentially have the Hubble scale on the same order as the cutoff given by the weak gravity conjecture. It should be noted that uh, these same disorder critical points can also be excluded on the basis of the Festina Lente bound, which we heard about earlier. Um, yesterday morning, for example, and uh, or in the previous talk. And uh, so our statement really is kind of a substatement of the Fistina Lente bound, uh, right, applied to Gravitini in particular, but it's arrived at on slightly different physical grounds. And so this can be regarded as a kind of consistency check or an indication uh, of the connection between the weak gravity conjecture and the Fistina Lente, right, which is also alluded to in uh, Thomas Henry's talk uh, yesterday. So the plan for uh, this, the, the rest of the talk here is that first I'll quickly review how the weak gravity conjecture applies to de Sitter critical points. Uh, then I will do a quick overview of the necessary um, n equals two supergravity ingredients and give a general proof of this main result. Uh, and finally, uh, hopefully I'll have time to discuss some examples and caveats to this, uh, to this result uh, in two or three uh, example models. So the magnetic weak gravity conjecture um, is the statement that 
in any uh, consistent effective theory of quantum gravity, if you have a U1 gauge coupling G, then the effective theory has a, an ultraviolet cutoff that is given by, uh, well, that's given by G times the, the Planck mass, right? So it's a abnormally lower uh, cutoff than you would expect just on sort of uh, effective field theory grounds. Uh, and here we put a, a charge, uh, kind of a unit charge if you want, right? And you can say that this, this has to hold for every charge, uh, non-zero charge in the effective theory. Of course, there's the smallest one. And so you can just say that it's set that to one and you get the usual uh, kind of statement. And uh, in the sitter space, in fact, just in curved backgrounds, um, there are some variations to the statement, uh, namely uh, explored in, in these two papers here. Um, but they basically just put an order one prefactor on this expression. Um, and because we'll be interested in the parametric relation between the Hubble scale of the sitter critical points and, uh, and this uh, ultraviolet cutoff, uh, this flat space uh, version is, is good enough for, for our purposes. So how does the weak gravity conjecture constrain um, the sitter spaces or quasi de sitter spaces? Uh, well, the constraint really is that the Hubble scale needs to be much like parametrically smaller than this, uh, than whatever cutoff you have, in particular the weak gravity cutoff. And the motivations for this statement, uh, well, there, there are a few. Uh, so a cut, one of them is that if you think of your theory as an effective theory and you include some higher curvature corrections, for example, then these higher curvature corrections are, of course, suppressed by appropriate powers of this cutoff. But the curvature itself is of order of the Hubble scale. And so H over lambda is really the expansion parameter of your EFT. And if you want that to be under control, then this has to be parametrically small. Uh, and in the sitter in particular, there's also a second argument one can make, which is that the thermal uh, nature of the sitter space uh, tells us that there will be fluctuations of order of the Hubble scale as well. And uh, you, know, you don't want to thermally fluctuate out of your effective field theory. So, H again needs to be parametrically smaller than the cutoff, right? And so this statement can be used to exclude uh, quasi de Sitter solutions. And I should point out that this is a qualitatively different criterion than uh, something like the de Sitter criterion or the Transplankian censorship conjecture, which deal more with the lifetime of de Sitter. Um, whereas this really only cares about what the Hubble scale is. So what the height of the potential is without regard to stability or other uh, issues like that. So first, uh, let's review uh, or introduce rather some uh, the, the necessary n equals two ingredients to make the general argument. So in n equals two supergravity, you have of course the gravity multiplet. It comes with uh, two gravitini and a gauge field uh, called the gravity photon, uh, and we can use this to gauge some symmetry. Uh, we can also introduce vector multiplets, which give us more gauge fields to play with. But these also come equipped with uh, Gagini and some complex scalar fields. And finally, we can have hypermultiplets, uh, which give us more scalar fields um, and their, their super partners. And uh, the scalar fields uh, form manifolds, which have uh, special structures. So these Zs, these uh, the vector scalars, are complex, and they span what's called a special scalar manifold. And the hyperscalers are uh, real. There are four per hypermultiplet, uh, and they span a quaternionic Kähler manifold. So, uh, what are these structures? Uh, well, a special Kähler manifold is uh, characterized, or could be specified, by a choice of a uh, holomorphic section, um, from which so we basically choose this, right? And then from this, we can compute a Kähler potential. And from the Kähler potential, uh, we can compute a metric on this field space. Uh, whereas the quaternionic Kähler manifold, well, you kind of have, just have to specify what the metric is. And uh, it comes equipped with a triplet of complex structures. And of course, the complex structures square to minus one. Uh, but they also satisfy an SU2 algebra between them. And so that's what makes it a quaternionic structure rather than uh, just uh, a triplet of random complex structures. Uh, and in particular, there's this quantity L lambda, which is a covariantly holomorphic uh, piece of this, uh, of this section, which will appear often in, in, uh, in the expressions. So just keep that in mind. So once we have our scalar manifolds, we have to pick 
uh, it will have they will have some isometries, and we can choose to gauge these isometries with the gauge fields that are available to us. And this is done by a choice of killing vectors. So the upper index here is the index on the corresponding uh, scalar manifold, and the lower index lambda tells us which gauge field we use to gauge these isometries. Uh, so lambda runs from zero to the number of vector multiplets. Zero corresponds to gauging with the gravity photon, and the rest correspond to the vector multiplets. And these then define prepotentials right through through these expressions, uh, which can be solved, and we can we can find the the prepotentials. And another useful quantity is this uh, U matrix, uh, which can also be computed from uh, covariant derivatives of these uh, covariantly holomorphic sections. And this U matrix is in particular related to the gauge kinetic ma matrix. So when it's it's useful for the scalar potential, but it also contains information about uh, the the couplings, the gauge couplings, which we will need for the uh, the weak gravity cutoff. Right. So uh, because we're interested in charged massless gravitini, of course we're going to have to uh, need we're, we're going to need expressions for the mass of the charge. And uh, the mass of the gravitini is given by a contraction of these uh, prepotentials with the holomorphic section. Whereas the charge matrix is given also in terms of these, the same prepotentials. Um, and here we introduce this, uh, it's kind of like a gauge field line and basically canonically normalizes our gauge fields. And uh, so really it behaves like a field line in the sense that it squares to the gauge kinetic uh, matrix. And one useful property here is that we get to choose which way these uh, flat indices point. So there's an SO and V plus one symmetry uh, that we have a freedom in choosing these. And we can always, let's say we have a certain U1 gauge symmetry that we want to apply the weak gravity conjecture with. Uh, well, we can choose our, these, uh, these field lines so that this U1 always points sort of in the Q1 direction. Right, and so when A is equal to one, this gives them the charge matrix for that U1 specifically. And the eigenvalues of this Q1 are the physical gravitino charges that are used to determine, uh, well, an upper bound on the weak gravity cutoff. Uh, so that gives us a cutoff. Now we want to compare this to the Hubble scale. So we need to compute the potential and the potential is a sum of three terms. Uh, uh, the first term here depends purely on the vector multiplet content. Then there's a piece depending on the uh, killing vectors along the, the hypermultiplet manifold. And V3 here depends on these prepotentials and contains this, uh, this matrix, which I remind you contains the gauge kinetic matrix for the, uh, for, for the gauge fields. And so now we're ready to make the general argument. It really just takes one slide once these ingredients are all in place. Uh, demanding that the gravitino mass matrix vanishes uh, really sets, uh, it is the same as demanding that this combination of the prepotential and the holomorphic section vanishes. And once we take the general expression for the potential and make this replacement, we can write the complete potential at the point where the mass matrix vanishes in this way. So uh, this term is the V2 that we had from the previous slide, it's positive definite, we don't really care about it. Uh, this term times the gauge kinetic matrix, the inverse gauge kinetic matrix, uh, is what gets left over from V3. And then these P0s come from a rewriting of V1 in terms of the prepotentials. And because this term is positive definite, we can just throw it away. So we have an inequality here. And then we're just going to trade these uh, gauge indices for the flat gauge indices, right? Using these uh, gauge field binds that we introduced. And then the trick is to recognize that this sum here uh, can be written as uh, a sum of traces of uh, well, delta um, two by two matrices, basically, right? The, the, the Pauli matrices and, and the identity. And so, uh, then, because we rotated our field binds in such a way that Q1 uh, corresponds to the U1 that we're interested in, uh, this is basically, you know, we can set A equal to 1 here, and then we'll have a bunch of other terms, of course, which are also positive definite. And so the potential is bounded below by essentially the sum of the squares of the physical gravitino charges, right? 
And so we have that the potential is bounded below by the weak gravity cutoff. And when we convert this to the Hubble scale, okay, there's a factor of uh, square root of three that appears, but this is a lower bound, first of all. And you know, square root of three is a order one, basically. And so the result here is that any disorder critical point with massless charged gravitini has the Hubble scale of order the weak gravity cutoff. And this means that uh, we lose control over our effective field theory description. So that's the, uh, the general statement. And now I want to uh, illustrate this uh, general statement at work in a few models that we explored in the paper. Uh, so the first model uh, is a model where we have stable disorder critical points in n equals to supergravity. Uh, so this is the choice of uh, special Kähler and quaternionic Kähler manifolds. Uh, I remind you that the special Kähler manifold is defined by a choice of, uh, is determined by a choice of, uh, you know, symplectic section. This is the choice. Um, and there are, there's an SO2 comma one isometry on the, the vector, uh, the vector scalar manifold. Uh, it's given by these, uh, kill, uh, by these killing vectors. And on the hyper side, uh, well, the hyper, manif the, the hyper manifold is SO4 comma two mod SO4 uh, times SO2. So the SO4 comma two generators uh, are uh, isometries of this manifold. And we can write these, uh, these generators basically six by six matrices with some ones and minus ones in the right places. And there's a U1 cubed isometry uh, in particular that we can pick out generated by these uh, three generators. So the T12 is uh, sort of the, the first two by two block, and then there's the next two by two block, and then the last two by two block in this six by six uh, matrix. So once we have these killing vectors at hand, uh, we have to choose how to gauge them. And so the way we're going to gauge them is that the gravity photon and the first two vector multiplets will gauge the vector isometries. And the last three uh, gauge fields will gauge the hyper isometries. And with this choice of gauging, we get a, we get a potential that has a critical point, uh, well, where all the fields vanish except Q1 and Q5 are equal to one. We call this the central point. Uh, at this point, we can also evaluate the prepotentials uh, because they we need them to compute the, the scalar potential. And we get that at the critical point, the value of the potential is given by this combination, right? The, the E4 and E5 are uh, the charges under these last uh, of, of these of these two isometries here, right? Uh, uh, these are parameters that appear in our choice of section. And one thing is interesting about this model is that its mass spectrum for the scalars is positive definite. So this, these two zero modes here are the Goldstone modes that get eaten by the non-compact generators of the SO2 comma one. Uh, and for the rest, uh, the masses are positive. Uh, so I think this is uh, perhaps the, the first example that's fully stable. Previous examples had some leftover massless, uh, massless modes and this, one, this model is similar in spirit, just slightly, slightly different gauging. Uh, the important thing here is that we can also compute the physical gravitino charge. Uh, and we see that it's given by this expression. And if you square it, you get exactly the, um, the value of the potential. And so again, we have the Hubble scales of order that we grab because, right? So this model would also be excluded by something like the TCC or the Desider criterion. And it, but it's nice to see that this criterion also picks up on, on the problems with this model. Um, the next uh, two examples that I wanna discuss uh, are related to each other. Uh, and they're models which contain uh, several critical points. Uh, and so here it's actually a slightly simpler model uh, in that it contains only three vector multiplets the hyper the, and two hyper multiplets. Uh, the hyper manifold is the same as before, uh, but the vector manifold is actually somewhat simpler and more canonical. Um, we have these three uh, gauge vectors here, uh, the, the three vector multiplets, and they can be rotated into each other by an SO3 isometry, right? So these are the killing vectors that generate that. And for the hyperscalers, again, we have the uh, the SO4 comma two generators giving us various isometries. And the ones we'll pick this time will be an SO3 isometry generated by the top left three by three block, basically of these six by six matrices. 
Uh, and then we can also take either a U1 or an O11 from the, from the other, the complementary three by three block. And depending on which one we gauge, uh, we'll have uh, different properties. So the way we're going to gauge this is we're going to identify the SO3s acting on the vectors on the scalars, and we're going to gauge both of them by the uh, vector multiples, right? Whereas the remaining U1 or O11 will be gauged by the gravity photon. Uh, and we can compute the, uh, the corresponding prepotentials. Uh, notably, uh, note that the O11 or the U11 prepotential will vanish. And so if we choose to gauge the O11 symmetry, we get, again, the central critical point, so at the same place as in the, in the, is in the other model. Um, and its height is given by this combination of the charges. So let me just uh, point out E0 is the, U11, is the O11 or the U1 charge, and E1 is the SO3 charge. Yeah. And the scalar masses are actually somewhat within the bounds of the De Sitter conjecture, right? They're, they are tachyonic and they're tachyonic with, of order one compared to the, the potential. The interesting about this model is that if you set E0 equal to E1, if you set the SO3 charge and the O11 charge equal to each other, you develop a flat direction along the imaginary components of the uh, vector scalars. Um, and if we then plot the, uh, the masses as a function of this flat direction, uh, we see that there's always going to be a tachyon uh, with mass squared over the potential equal to you know, 0 0.4, which is sort of within the bounds of the De Sitter conjecture. Um, and then you, know, you have the, 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 the zero modes, which uh, get eaten actually by the O11 here. Uh, and the rest of the spectrum kind of flows. Um, so then we can ask, uh, what are the charges and particular work, how, how do they depend on this modulus now that we have? And along this direction, because we've singled out the Z2 direction, we break the SO3 to a U1 and its U1 charge is the physical charge of the gravity, you know, is given by this uh, entry here. And interestingly, the O11 charge here will be zero and we'll see it when we replace this by U1, it will also be zero. So this is really the, the uh, sort of abelian charge uh, that we have here, um, which gives us the weak gravity cutoff. Now the gravitino mass matrix is uh, given by this matrix here. And we see that as Z goes to zero, as we go back to the central point, the gravitino mass matrix vanishes, right? Um, and if we actually plot the mass as a function of Z, we see that it vanishes here and then it grows. And this is in units of the, the Hubble scale here. Uh, but if we, the solid line here actually shows the, the weak gravity cutoff in units of the Hubble scale. And we see that here it's of order one. And it's only at large values of Z that the weak gravity cutoff actually goes above the Hubble scale by any appreciable amount. And so in this shaded region, we expect to have control over our EFT. But as we go back to the massless limit of the, the gravitini, we also see that this correlates with, uh, with, with the loss of control over the EFT. And so again, this is, this is a perfect demonstration that the massless charge gravitino limit puts sort of the, these critical points in the swampland. And again, this would also be ruled out by the Fistina Lente bound because the, it's a substate of the distinction. Now, the final model, the final example illustrates some caveats. We have seven more minutes. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes, yes, I'll, I'll, yeah, I, I'll need about that. Um, so the, the very last example here, um, uh, where, where we gauge uh, a U1 symmetry instead of an O11 symmetry, uh, also has a central critical point. Uh, it has vanishing gravitino masses there uh, at the central critical point. The potential is given by three times the SO3 charge here. E1 was the SO3 charge, if you remember. Uh, the scalar mass spectrum also respects the De Sitter conjecture, so it's a tachyonic, it's a, it's a tachyonic critical point. Again, the masses here, you know, two thirds is basically one. And what's interesting here is that uh, the charge of the gravitino under the U1 is zero, right? So we can't really use that as our weak gravity cutoff. Whereas uh, the SO3 at the, central, uh, at the central critical point remains unbroken. And so it's not clear, we don't really have an isolated U1 that we can use to apply the weak gravity conjecture, but we can imagine moving slightly 
away from this critical point. And there will be a, some region, some, you know, it will be a runaway direction, of course, but for some amount of time, we'll have some kind of uh, evolution close to the critical point where we do have a U1 uh, symmetry and perhaps that's good enough, right? So then these charges, uh, one of these charges would become a U1 charge essentially. And again, we'd, uh, we'd, we'd see sort of a violation of the, the, the weak gravity conjecture. Um, but another property of this model is that it has a second critical point. And this one happens when you set the real value of one of the scalars, of the vector scalars, and the imaginary part of a different scalar to one half. And in that case, you still get a critical point with height similar to the, uh, to the central one. The scalar mass spectrum also respects the Sitter conjecture. There's two tachyons. Uh, the gravitino remains uncharged under the U11, but the SO3 is completely broken. And so now we don't have any uh, U1 charge to apply the weak gravity conjecture. And interestingly, the gravitino mass matrix acquires a zero eigenvalue. So one of the gravitini uh, becomes massless while the other one stays massive. And there's nothing we can really do about this uh, critical point, right? It respects the Sitter conjecture. There is no weak gravity conjecture to apply to it. Uh, and so it's not, this really shows a caveat in, in the criteria. And so again, so to conclude, uh, the main sort of takeaways uh, are that we cannot use the weak gravity conjecture to constrain quasi to uh solutions. Uh, the main result here, the general result is that the sitter critical points with charged light gravity in n equals two supergravity are in violation of this weak gravity constraint in the sense that they have the Hubble scale of order the UV uh, cutoff. This criterion here is contained within the fistina lente bound, but has different physical motivation. And as we saw from the various examples, it's somewhat independent of the Sitter swamp land conjectures and the TCC, right? In the sense that you can have permutations where you know, they're fine with one criterion, but not with another. Um, and so that, and so yeah, I showed some examples of, uh, of that happening. So uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, yeah, that's it. So thank you, Maxim. So is there any question or comment in the in the room, in the auditorium? Well, I have a I have a small question I could ask you. Yeah. So is it relevant the choice of the potential in, in the N equals the two model? Like for example, if you were to consider also like magnetic or dionic gauges, could you expect uh, changes or? Oh, um, the yeah, so the, the gaugings are already not uh, really electric. So the, the choice of, uh, so especially in, in this first model, uh, the choice of section is already very nonstandard. Like it's not, it's not one that you get from just a pre-potential. You have to do some uh, derul wagemans rotation here. And in fact, for a long time, uh, so, so th these, these rotations are kind of uh, a standard trick to obtain the sitter to, to get a sort of uplift for your energy. And so the important thing is that this same parameter ends up entering uh, in the vacuum energy here. So no matter what you choose, it's, uh, it, it enters both really, right? So the, the proof of the general statement is really general, right? We made no assumption as to, uh, how we choose the uh, the the section originally? Thanks. So let's check if there is any question in the online version. No. Okay. So if there are no more questions, let's thank Maxine again for the talk. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. And now we continue. Hi, Hello, can you hear me? 
Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, so can you share your... Yeah, yeah. And... Just one second. Okay, everything all right? Okay, perfect. Looks perfect. So we continue with the last speaker of today, Guru Gursinich. So he will tell us about the beef reaction of the reaction model. So whenever you want, please. Thank you. Uh, so first I'd like to take, thank the organizers for allowing me to speak, speak at this conference. And today I'm going to talk about uh, recent work I have done uh, with Athanasios Hatzitavrakitis, Larissa Yonke, Zoltan Kokeniesi, and Thomas Schobel. So I'm going to talk about, as you have heard and can see, about BV action of the Dirac Sigma model. Uh, Two-dimensional Sigma models, as you all know, are very important in physics. They show up in string theory, conformal field theory, and other places as well. Out of these, uh, there uh, I'm going to look more closely at uh, class of topological Sigma models in two dimensions, examples of which are A and B models, Poisson sigma model, age twisted or untwisted, both are topological, and Dirac sigma model, which is of interest here. So uh, I'm going to talk about the BV quantization specifically. Now, uh, one way to find BV quantization of certain models is through AKSZ construction. It is a nice geometric way to construct different BV actions. One example is the Poisson sigma model that uh, comes up uh, through this construction. However, uh, the AKZ construction requires the QP structure on a target manifold, which is, uh, which is a bit restrictive at uh, certain situations. Specifically, uh, if we have a sigma model with a Vesumino term, uh, the target space in general does not have a QP structure. So the AK, uh, so the AKZ construction cannot be used. So there, uh, we have to find a different way to construct uh, to co to construct it. So uh, recently, uh, Ikeda and Strobel uh, wrote a paper about the BV quantization of or the BV action for the H twisted Poisson sigma model. And uh, here I'm going to talk about more generally about the Dirac Sigma model, which does have the Poisson Sigma model, the H twisted version, uh, as its special case. So uh, let's begin. We have the general action for the 2D Sigma model uh, in a general D dimensional target space M. So we have the metric term and the Vesumino term. Uh, so we have the closed form H. Uh, we have the function X from the world sheet sigma two, and we have the sigma uh, sigma free. Uh, so the Vesumino term on sigma free, which is an open membrane uh, with sigma two as a boundary, open membrane wor world world volume. Now, uh, what I'm going uh, going to look at at this point is gauging of this. Uh, of this sigma model of this action. However, I'm not going to uh, be doing it in a traditional way. I'm not going to find the global symmetries and then promote them to local symmetries and then uh, gauge those local symmetries. But instead, I'm going uh, to look at, uh, I'm going to approach it in a little bit of a different way. So the idea is to, uh, is to gauge this action by introducing some gauge fields such that uh, the gauge transformations of the X fields uh, are simple shifts with some gauge parameter. Uh, so it's a little bit of a different approach, but not too different. So uh, first, in order to prepare for this, I'm introducing uh, a Lie algebraid L uh, that is equipped with an anchor row uh, that goes from the algebraid L to the target space M and we have some Lie bracket on this algebra. Also, I'm introducing the local basis of sections, EA, here. And also, uh, once I have these, uh, these bases, I can introduce structure functions through, uh, uh, through the Lie bracket. So the Lie bracket of 
E A and E B gives me the structure functions time E C. Also, an anchor mag for a Lie algebra is an uh, homomorphism. So if I act with an anchor on a section of a Lie algebra, specifically E A, I will get a section in a tangent bundle on M. So if I act with raw on a uh, on E A, I will get a section on a tangent bundle T M. And this section I will denote with row A. And since the anchor map is homomorphism, uh, the commutator, which is the standard uh, commutator on the tangent bundle of vector fields, the commutator of rows has the same structure, uh, same structure functions as the basis uh, introduced before. So the basis E. Okay, so now I want to uh, find the gauged action with some gauge fields, uh, such that the transformation of the X is equal to rho I A epsilon A. So epsilon here is the gauge parameter, while uh, rho A I is, uh, are, the, are the components of the vector field rho A. Now, uh, the, ga ga the gauge fields A will be chosen such that they are one forms on a world sheet but they take values in our Lie algebra L. So the A can be decomposed as AA times EA, where AA is uh, one, uh, one form on a world sheet. And now I have the extended uh, sigma model action. So the gauged, uh, the gauged action down here. Uh, so I have this uh, metric far, uh, part, GIJ, FI, uh, VEG, FOG, FJ. Uh, where the Fs are uh, down here, dxi minus rho ia, AA, which is the standard uh, form formulation when constructing covar uh, covariant derivatives for gauge fields. Uh, when, ga when gauging uh, actions in general. Uh, also, I introduce other terms that, uh, that are now that are at this point not yet determined. So I have a uh, theta where theta is a one form and gamma a a term uh, where gamma is some function that is yet to be determined. Uh, okay, and now uh, we want to look for the conditions under which uh, that gauge action is invariant under a gauge transformation. So we have already written that the transformation of X uh, should be uh, rho times epsilon. Uh, and the transformation for A, uh, we'll choose it in this general form. So D epsilon times C A epsilon, which is the uh, usual thing that we have, and plus two extra terms that are proportional to F and Hodge F with coefficients omega and phi. Now, this condi uh, the conditions uh, for, the, for the action to be gauge invariant under these transformations turn out to be this, so these two. Uh, the, uh, this was done in a paper a few years ago by Thanasis, Andreas Desser, Larissa Jonke, and Thomas Strobel. Uh, so these are the conditions, and we also have three additional constraints. So the first one uh, gives, gives us exactly what gamma is in terms of everything else. And the second two uh, gives us some con uh, constraints on theta and basically on theta and the rows as well. Now, uh, what we are going to be mostly interested in is how we can uh, describe these conditions and constraints geometrically. First, we are going to look at the constraints that we had before. So what we are going to look at is the generalized tangent bundle, T plus T star M, and the general vectors of uh, Xi A of the form rho A plus theta A. So rho comes from Tm and theta comes from T star M. And now uh, this bundle, so the generalized tangent bundles, forms an H-twisted Quran algebra with bilinear pairing of this form and the twisted Quran bracket. So twisted by the free form H. Now, if we look at the constraints that we got for, uh, that we pre uh, got on a previous slide, uh, those constraints can be written in a simple form so that the pairing of two size is zero and that uh, the bracket 
the Quran bracket of two xi is proportional to xi, so that the xi are closed under the Quran bracket. And this structure, so the sub bundle of, of the generalized tangent bundle, or generally Quran and Quran algebra, that satisfies these conditions is called a Dirac structure uh, that we will denote by E. And in general, this can be uh, a, full, a small Dirac structure or a full Dirac structure. So the full Dirac structure is the one, is the Dirac structure with uh, maximal dimension possible. And here we are going to restrict ourselves only to the full Dirac structures. Uh, the, uh, this is important because for the full Dirac structure, uh, the ma uh, we can construct uh, the, uh, this calligraphic G plus minus as theta plus minus rho star. Here rho star is just uh, is just a form uh, that we get by uh, mapping the vectors rho with the metric on the cotangent bundle. Uh, on the full Dirac structure, these combinations turn out to be invertible maps, though uh, neither rho nor theta in general have to be. There are cases where they, where they are, but in general they aren't. But these combinations always are, which is going to be important for uh, everything we uh, do it we do further. Okay, so that was the geometric interpretation of the constraints, so that we have the Dirac structure, and that is the reason why the model I'm looking is called the Dirac, uh, Dirac Sigma model. Uh, but now we also have uh, the parameters omega and phi in the gauge transformations for A that we introduced. What we can look at is the how they transform under, uh, under the change of local basis on L, or more specifically on E, since we are restricted on uh, the <clears throat> on Dirac structure at the moment, uh, it turns out that phi transforms as a usual tensor, and omega transforms as a connection. <clears throat> so the phi is just an endomorphism, while omega uh, omega a b represents the coefficients of a connection on E that we will denote as nabla omega. So now blah omega acting on EA gives me omega BA times EB. <clears throat> However, it is more useful to combine omega and phi into two different uh, connections. So now blah plus minus with coefficients omega plus minus that are uh, defined as small omega plus minus phi. And this will be much, uh, it, it is much more natural to write everything everything else uh, using those omega plus minus, omega plus minus instead of omega and phi. And uh, they can be extracted from the conditions, these, uh, these uh, uh, connection coefficients, and they are given by, uh, by this expression. Here, uh, nabla circle denotes some torsionless connection on M. Okay, uh, now that we have these, these two connections, nabla plus and minus, we can define uh, new connections, nabla star plus minus on T star M by, uh, uh, by adding, uh, by composition of uh, nabla plus minus with calligraphic G and inverse of calligraphic G. Uh, and the coefficients of these connections, once you calculate it, uh, turn out to be this, this thing. And here, gamma circle are the coefficients of the connection nabla circle introduced previously. And now that we have these, uh, these two connections, we uh, define uh, two new connections on TM, uh, nabla leather plus minus, and they have connections gamma plus minus that are equal to this, with theta plus minus being the torsion tensors of the connections, with uh, which are equal to this thing down here. Okay. Uh, besides besides these two connections on TM and T star M, we can also uh, introduce the curvature of double plus minus. In the usual uh, in the usual Cartan formalism, they are given as the omega plus omega omega, and these uh, curvature tensors satisfy the Bianchi identity uh, down here. Now, 
Additional thing uh, that will be extremely useful is to introduce the so-called E connections, which will be denoted by this symbol. And uh, in this case, we can define it through this equation. So these aren't exactly uh, connections, but uh, covariant derivatives. So uh, e, nabla E uh, in E direction acting on E prime uh, has to be equal to nabla in rho of E direction acting on E prime. So it's just a bit of a generalization at this point. Uh, we can also compute the torsions for these uh, E connections that are given by T plus minus here. And we define something that is called the basic curvature uh, that is uh, defined here, which is basically definition of the basic curvatures with R plus minus being the standard curvature. Okay, now that we have introduced basically the geometry that we, uh, that we need from the Dirac Sigma model, uh, we are. Uh, we have to go to the BB action. Uh, first, we look at the BRST, uh, the BR, uh, BRST extension of the of our action. So, uh, in order to do that, in order to do that, uh, we have to enlarge our field quantity. So we had fields X and A, but we also introduce a new ghost field C for uh, our gauge parameter epsilon and assign it goes degree one. And we also introduce the BRST operator S that acts on these fields uh, as, as it is written here. As we can see, uh, when S acts on X and A, it looks like uh, gauge transformations. So uh, nothing special and SC, S acting on C, is introduced the, uh, in this way, and it is introduced in such a way that the BRST operator uh, is nilpotent on shell. So S squared acting on X is zero, S squared acting on C is zero, while S squared acting on A is, has a term proportional to F and to Hodge F. And F here is an equation of motion for the Dirac sigma model. So it is proportional to the equation of motion. Uh, here, S and S uh, twiddle uh, that are, uh, that are, compo uh, that are uh, factors that multiply F and Hodge F are given as combinations down here of S plus and S minus. <clears throat> now that we introduce the BRST part, uh, we go to the full, uh, we have to go to the full BB action. So uh, now we have to introduce uh, anti-fields for each field that we had uh, had previously. So we had three fields, X, A, and C, and we introduce uh, their appropriate anti-fields that are denoted by dagger. So those anti-fields has a uh, form degree that is complementary to the, our original field. So uh, the, sum, the sum of form degree for Original field and anti-field has to be two since we are uh, looking at two-dimensional sigma models. Similarly, similarly uh, those degrees uh, has to sum up to minus one. And here we have the table of all or life fields, their goals degrees and their form degrees. <clears throat> okay. Now, in order to construct the BV action, what we are going to do is we are going to decompose the full BV action into smaller parts. So in this case, S0, S1, and S2. And here the index denotes the number of anti-fields that show up in each, uh, in each of these sectors. So S0 uh, has no anti-fields and it is just a classic collection. S1 has one anti-field and S2 has two anti-fields. Of course, uh, in general, we should include uh, higher terms as well. So S3, S4, and so on. Uh, but in this case, it turns out that S2 is enough, that we don't need S3. Okay, so S0 is the classic collection. S1, uh, S, uh, we know how to write S1. It is given here, and, uh, it is, uh, and the form of S1 is completely fixed in the BV formalism since it reflects the gauge invariance of the classic collection. Uh, now, the sector S2 uh, has, to, has to be constructed and it 
uh, and we are going to construct it in a way that uh, the full BB action satisfies the classical master equation SS equals zero, where uh, this is the anti-bracket. So the anti-bracket of SS is zero. Now, uh, taking into account the composition of the BB action, uh, this can be uh, decomposed into five separate equations. So the anti-bracket of S0 and with S0 is zero trivially, since S0 does not contain any anti -brackets. Uh The anti-bracket of S0 and S1 also vanishes identically uh, because of the construction uh, of S1 that we introduced. So because the form of S1. And then we are left with three equations that all have to be satisfied in order for uh, our BV action to hold. Now we make an answer for S2. So S2 has, uh, uh, has two anti-fields in its terms, and those will be a dagger in this case. So uh, we need, uh, it turns out that we need only two terms, a dagger wedge a dagger, and a dagger wedge hodge a dagger. Uh, also, this answer immediately uh, makes uh, the final equation up here. So the anti-bracket of S2 with S2 to vanish immediately since uh, there is no pair of field and anti-field in S2. So there is uh, field X, but not X dagger. There is A dagger, but not A. And there is C, but not C dagger. So this equation is automatically satisfied. <clears throat> Y and Z are here some coefficients that we uh, still have to determine. Uh, and in order to determine these two, we are going to, uh, we can plug this into this, this equation. So uh, S1, S1 plus two, S0, S2. And this completely determines uh, Y and Z coefficients. Uh, here we introduce Y plus minus uh, just, because it's much simpler, and then y plus minus is given by this. However, in order uh, for this to be okay, we still have to check whether S anti bracket of S1 with S2 vanishes. Because if it doesn't, we already need to extend our answers for S2 or introduce S3 as part of the expansion of the BV action. Uh, now, S, uh, now, it's not completely trivial to prove this. And basically, we've, uh, we have to prove a few identities first uh, that then we can use to plug this in into the expression you get for this anti-bracket. Now, the first one, the first expression here uh, is the covariantization of uh, the commutator of, uh, of rows. So uh, the commutator, so commutator of row A with row B is C, C, A, B, row C. And now instead of uh, the standard uh, partial derivative in the commutator of the vector fields, we uh, covariantize it to nabla plus minus. Uh, the second one is the covariantization of the Jacobi identity. The third one is the commutator of uh, covariant derivatives uh, of the connections in general that we uh, are using. And uh, these, three, uh, these three expressions can also be then used uh, along with uh, conditions for the gauge invariance to express T plus minus in terms of rows and thetas. And uh, using this, it can then be proven that, S, uh, that the anti-bracket of S1 with S2 indeed vanishes. So the action that we have written, it is actually a BB action for the Dirac Sigma model. And here it is its full form. So we have S0 as our classical action. We have S1, uh, which, uh, which was uh, easily found. So we have X dagger part, C dagger part, and all of those others is A dagger part. And we have S2 given by uh, these pairings of, uh, calligraphic G inverse with S plus or minus with basic curvatures. Uh, now it is interesting to look at the special case of the Poisson Sigma model, uh, H-twisted Poisson Sigma model. Uh, so uh, it is a special case of a Dirac Sigma model uh, with the Dirac structure being the cotangent bundle. 
uh, the anchor being the Poisson by vector pi and the metric being equal to zero. Of course, it is possible to look at this with metric not being equal to zero, but uh, here we have taken uh, this, uh, here I have taken just this special case to make, to make things easier. So here S0 is the standard, uh, standard classical action for the Poisson Sigma model. S1 uh, just tells me what are the, tells us what are the gauge transformations uh, of the Poisson Sigma model. And S2 is then given by this thing. So uh, actually this is the expression that was found in the paper by uh, Ikeda and Strobel uh, two years ago. Uh, and it is interesting because it does have uh, this term pi 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 h h, which is uh, something uh, which is a bit unexpected, uh, but uh, it is something that cannot be reproduced uh, through AKSX from construction specifically. Uh, okay, so in summary, uh, we have found the BB action of the Dirac Sigma model. We haven't, but not using the AKS Z construction since that approach is obstructed by not having the QP structure, but we have uh, done it, let's call it order by order. So by the expansion of the BB action uh, through the number of anti-fields in each sector. <clears throat> now, there are uh, also a few things that uh, we can, that it is possible to do in the future, either, either by adding to this work or uh, doing similar work. So one thing is to investigate the quantization of the Dirac Sigma model. So to find, to look at the quantum master equation, to find the, uh, the correlation functions and look what happens with the star product. Uh, one other thing is uh, that we can also do is to investigate how the change in metric uh, affects the BB action. It is interesting because uh, in, uh, in the original classical theory of the Dirac Sigma model, the metric, uh, the equations of motions are invariant under the change of metric. So there should be some kind of equivalence between different BV, uh, BV actions uh, that, that, are, that have different metrics. However, it is not completely trivial to find what kind of equivalence this is. Also, the other thing that we could do is also look for the BV actions of some other sigma models that also cannot uh, be found through the AKZ construction. Uh, one, such, uh, one such example is the Jacobi sigma model that we have introduced in our paper uh, last year. There are also a few other possibilities like, uh, uh, like uh, the same thing that we did here, but instead of classical Vesemina term, we can also have non-closed preform H, uh, which we also investigated in the same paper. Uh, so there are very diff uh, different, uh, different topological sigma models that still are not completely explained through, uh, that are not, uh, that the BB actions of which are not known yet. So there is a lot of work here done. So thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Thank you for your, for your talk. Hello, I cannot hear what you are talking, what you are saying. I, I was just asking for a question. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, so if you have a question, just think blue good again. Thanks. 